you can always cut it later. Yeah. Hey guys, my name is Hamza, and in this video, I'll be interviewing Marco Giordano on SEO, data analytics, and data science. Marco, how's it going? Thank you, Hamza. Very well. What about you? Yeah, doing great, doing great. So uh, just to start off, could you uh, just talk about how you how you go into SEO and what you're currently working on now, and just a bit about yourself? Sure. So I got into SEO first in December 2017 because a friend of mine had a publisher website. So I started using Yoast. I helped him a little bit. And like today, I was already searching, Googling how this SEO stuff worked. And I learned from there, essentially, one project after another one. And it was at the beginning, it was very, very simple because it was mostly content and stuff. Then, you know, it started becoming more challenging. And yeah. right now, I work as an in-house for a company, but as well as a freelance consultant. Oh, I see. And yeah, and they mostly do not only SEO, but also, you know, analytics and consulting stuff about data. Yeah, yeah. And I remember you on our first Twitter space that we did, which was like a very long time ago, yeah. you, you spoke a lot about data science, data analytics. And one thing I kind of want to know more about is um, how you sort of got enveloped into the data analytics side of things whilst you were doing SEO. Was it more so that you just saw that the two were related, so you just sort of put it together? Or was there more of a chronological like order to it or story, would you say? No, it, it was more chronological. Yeah. The second one, yeah. Because actually, I wanted to stop doing SEO while in college. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then it was like, no, the competition for pure, you know, for doing pure data stuff, the competition was much higher mm. because you would have to have a super technical background back then, like two, three years ago. Yeah. So I was like, no, maybe it's better to combine it with SEO. But I would say it's even better because, you know, at the end of the day, SEO is an industry like finance, healthcare or any other. So it's kind of better to have your industry. So you're not a generalist. You have something Absolutely. very specific to, to cover. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's really, really interesting. And so when you did sort of make that transition or addition between SEO and data analytics and building that skill set, could you talk more about your experiences around that and how you noticed your career and your life sort of changed? Did you notice, you know, more opportunities popping yeah. up? Was it less? How, how, how did it sort of go for you? Well, it was like three years ago or something like that, or maybe four, when I started uh, reading on the topic. I was like, oh, this actually makes sense. And it's yeah. also paid a lot because I was seeing that in the US, they paid a lot for this stuff. It was the hype period, right? Before the COVID, before oh, really? the tech bubble. Yeah. So everyone applied to Fang, if you sell it that in English. Oh, so see. Facebook, Amazon, yeah, Apple, yeah, thank, all thank of them. You. And during the type, started during the type, starting with the basics, right? And then yep. in the last year, I refined it to be even more narrow. Because you don't need to learn it all. You just need to know what's profitable in SEO and for business owners, which is a very small subset of essentials. So you, you don't actually do all the complex stuff, in my opinion. It's very, very rare. And you don't even need to, to make money because you know it's not about engineering. It's about SEO. In many cases, it's simple stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely true. Fully agree with that. And so I kind of want to more, so first off, I'd like to talk more about SEO and your expertise around that and your knowledge around that. And then we can sort of dive into data science, sure. data analytics, and you know, just more around your stories and anecdotes around that. So starting off with SEO, one thing I've noticed when looking at your content, when from the amount of time I've been following you, is that you put a very huge emphasis on data. And I, I think I heard you right, seen one of your tweets talking about um, how people use the t concept of data-driven SEO. And I think you spoke about how you like don't like the term. And yeah, yeah. You spoke, yeah, you, you spoke I about mean, that. Yeah. In, in all honesty, yeah, in all honesty, when I, I cringe a little bit when they say data-driven because it's a buzzword. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those buzzwords that you have in a lot of industries. Yeah, buzzwords. Where, yeah, where if you say that you're automatically invincible because you're objective, which is not true because at the end, everything is interpretation and bias, especially in SEO. Because I can tell you, look, data say that the search volume for this term is X. But I can also tell you, look, this is a bad argumentation because for B2B, I don't care about the volume. I care about the po the, the potential, another type Absolutely. of potential. Absolutely. So this is an example. Usually, the correct word would be data informed, which means you use data, but you still take the decisions 
and you can still go against data if they don't make any sense, which can Absolutely. happen. Absolutely. Like I told you, search volume sometimes doesn't make any sense, especially if you do B2B. Yeah, 100%, 100% agree with you. And it does remind me of this post I saw uh, on LinkedIn about like a few weeks ago, I'd say, where someone shared a clip of Jeff Bezos, you know, uh, from Amazon, <laughs> um, and he was talking about uh, how the best decisions he's made in business weren't purely based off of data, but they were informed with data, but made through intuition, heart, yeah. and just logic, essentially. So I kind of want to know more about want to dive deeper into that and making better SEO related decisions whilst being informed with data, but not letting it dictate the decision you make. So can yeah, you tell me yeah. about that? I, I have that. a lot of great examples on this one. Yeah, absolutely. And the best example is when you buy an age domain. Mm. Okay. So a lot of people say, I go by gut, my intuition. Okay. But if you buy 10 domains and you have the money, you don't care if two are bad. No, who cares? But if you are like many people and you want to buy one domain, like uh, you get it wrong, you lose a lot of money. So this is one example because a lot of people don't ask for Search Console or their data. Usually, I've always get them. You can, if you want to buy an age domain, I have always, like in 30 times, 29, 29 times, I've always got Search Console. So you can analyze it or you can check stuff because they usually give you even for super big domains. But many people don't do it, just check SAMrush, Hrefs, and say, yeah, the backlinks are good. Yeah. And, you know, OK, you still have to check backlinks. Of course you have. But in general, you may want to do something deeper to avoid getting scammed yep. or getting destroyed. Because sometimes you don't need to do it. You just check the content. You say the content is bad. <laughs> or you say the content is not what I was looking for. But in other cases, you need to use data. Right. So if it is a long-term decision, use data. Makes sense. If you are a surgeon, you have to save a life, or you are in a life-death situation, do whatever the first thing that you're thinking, sense. like yeah. the first thing. Yeah. If you have a urgent decision, it's better to do something rather than waiting. Absolutely. But Fully. in most cases, yeah, in most cases, it's not life or death or urgent. It's usually planning. So. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And I kind of want to also dive more deep into uh, an alternative to how to actually approach making better decisions in SEO through data without, I know I know this is kind of basically similar to what I already yeah. you, but I kind of want to dive more into specifically how you mentioned with when to make the, those types of decisions, when to not use those types of decisions, when data makes sense, and when data doesn't make sense. And you also mentioned about backlinks and how you know, people basically judge a backlink based on certain metrics that don't make sense. So I kind of want to know, based on your expertise, what you think is the best way to measure if a backlink is a high quality or if a certain keyword is worth targeting or if a certain decision is worth making, essentially. Okay. So, you kind of, so you've gone over like, okay, you shouldn't do this. I kind of want to go over now what you should do, if that makes sense. So, yeah. Okay, so for backlinks, there is one problem. You don't yep. have Google. That, I mean, okay, you have Search Console data, but they are impartial like inaccurate not complete and you don't have a domain authority or link score given absolutely. by google absolutely you have to rely on third party usually the criteria if, to evaluate if a good back a, a backlink is good or not are the domain first of all the domain and the page should get traffic if you get a link from a page that is not getting traffic the effect is much 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 lower Second, I mean, the network, we can say, of the website. Usually, a website above 40 is OK. Not always. I, I know that it's not an official metric and whatever. But usually, about 40, about 40 starts to get good, decent. And then, of course, it should be related to your niche, even though this one maybe is the least important, because in some cases, it doesn't really have to. It works anyway, so at your own risk. For the, uh, you mentioned another stuff other than backlinks. Yeah. Wait. So um, aside from backlinks, mainly like when to know if a keyword is worth targeting. Ah, okay, okay. And, yeah, and also like just but general decisions around SEO. Okay. But to actually make sure you judge if if the decision is worth going for and yeah. and things like yeah. that. So, yeah. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So usually one premise. Uh, I think that in many cases, especially if you are talking about the US or English market, so our main market. Yeah. You should have money. 
So let's start with the premise that the client or the other party or you or whoever has the money. Usually it's worth targeting if you can write a lot of related topics, if it is an article, let's talk about content. If it is an article, yeah, if you can write related articles on the topic, if it fits one of your clusters, then it, it, it's worth it, okay? Yeah. Even though it's competitive, you may need it to complete your cluster. Yeah. But the, the thing is that in reality, most of the times people don't have enough budget, writers, or you can't afford quality. So I would say that the keyword is worth targeting. If you have, you know, a decent, ROI, if you can expect something in exchange for it, because usually you don't rank for one keyword, you rank for more with a page. And of course, if you have the capacity to update it, to update the piece of content or the article over time to keep it. So if there is a good ROI, you should always target it. All right, awesome. That was really, really good. Um, and so going off that, I kind of want to talk more around sort of the data side of things. So we, we covered a bit about the SEO. I kind of want to know more about like, if you could expand more on how you got into the data side of things and also what were the main core things that you started and focused on learning in order to build that sort of like fundamental stage and get the basics down. Sure. So in general, I recommend this stuff, not to everyone, but only to some people that are interested in doing, you know, stuff by yourself. Because in our job, but in also in other jobs, yeah. when you want to do something with data, you have to ask someone else. And yeah. they don't like asking other people to do my stuff. You can yeah. do it yourself in most cases, right? Independence. So, <laughs> yes, yes. Usually if you want independence or to speed up your work, or if you are deep into domains, you know, all this stuff, decision-making, then it's for you. And the best way to learn depends on your background, because if you already know Excel functions, not Excel, Excel functions or stuff, you have an advantage. If you start from scratch, I recommend, uh, you know, attending DataQuest, this website does courses, start learning some Python or R, do some base, some practice, some practical projects, and then niching down into SEO, automating your work, learning which data you need and so on. It takes some time, I would say one year at least, because at the end, it's another job. It's not SEO, it's, it's another job. It's like saying, I want to learn UX. Okay, yeah. but it's not SEO, it's another job. Yeah, absolutely. So it's only for those that are dedicated to do it. And unlike many think or guess, it's not really needed or it's not, you know, only if you want to work as an employee, because a lot of entrepreneurs create tools, do SAS, or have consultancy, and they know this stuff. Yep. So it's for everyone. I mean, it applies to every single profession, career path, whatever you want to take. Uh, you can just use this knowledge. The basic is just learning, you know, one programming language because it makes your life easier, either Python or R, knowing a little bit of databases and learn SQL to query them. And again, it's not super complex stuff because you don't need to be a developer. And now you have ChatGPT, which is also super valid. I use it every day. So yep. it's very, very valid if you can prompt decently. Yep. And the rest is practice, practice. And of course, knowing what the, the other people want, which is kind of disappointing for some people. Because you do the crazy job and then stakeholders or people want the PowerPoint with one plot. Yeah. Which is kind of disappointing, but it's also cool because you don't need to study much in that case. So this is the actual path. It's not so shiny as many think. It's mostly boring as SEO. I mean, it's the usual boring uh, repetitive stuff, but it's worth it over time, especially if you're young, because you don't have to ask anyone and you don't you don't have to waste hours in Excel because it's shit essentially. Yep, yep. That was, that was amazing. That was amazing. And obviously, you mentioned like AI ChatGPT in basically all of my podcasts I've done so far. That's something that we like to talk about because you know it's a big, big topic. Um, and I kind of also want to know more about. So you spoke about you know data, and you spoke about your recommendations in terms of how to go about it. And in terms of that, I'm more curious to know about. Uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. This happens in every interview I do. Sorry. So when it comes to like 
SEO, but then also like data. Could you talk more about when you were actually utilizing both to actually get the best results for clients and how you were able to sort of like incorporate the two once you got good at SEO and then, you know, sort of incorporate the data? Yeah, yeah the case is for audits. Yeah. Because in audits, you analyze data. Yeah. So here is the answer. Or when you do research, you can speed it up. But actually for research, nowadays, my process is much easier because now with keyword clustering tools, you know, you just filter the keywords, feed them to a tool, and then you, you modify their stuff, but it's mostly easier now. So content audits is a big point or automation or this stuff where you can find a lot of opportunities because you must process data. If you want to do an audit, you must work with Search Console analytics data. Yep. And the average advice is quite stupid because filtering by the interface is not really giving recommendation. If you have a big website, a lot of stuff you read on Twitter is not, can't work. You need something more advanced. And then, and this is where this stuff comes into play. Uh, so yeah, essentially audits, finding opportunities, monitoring a website. And one area that is very underrated for portfolio owners and big companies is creating internal tools. Because mm -hmm. developers or engineers know the code, but don't know anything about metrics or this stuff, what to measure. So you can help them. You can tell them what to measure, how, et cetera. So this is another potential area. Yeah, that's because, definitely something I want to dive into more later with like building tools to actually grow your SEO. That's a very interesting topic yeah. to talk about as well in like my backlinking videos. But yeah, sorry. Continue. I just I just had to say that was like really cool. No, no, no. It's fine. That's yeah. it. Usually that's how you do. There are maybe other use cases, but I like to keep it simple because I'm telling you, I don't care about automating a, an XML sitemaps. This is something you usually see online. Yeah. People creating something to automate. But my man, it's already available on WordPress everywhere. You don't need to, yeah. to work on that. You want to automate something related to SEO, where engineers have the match down, we can say, or stuff that you can only do. Yep. This is the main point I want to stress. Because you don't have to replace, you will never replace an engineer or a developer. You should be hybrid, but never go too much into their territory because it's not profitable and it won't be SEO anymore, if you know what I mean. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yeah, that, that, that was amazing. So based off of that, I also, like I said, we could talk more about internal tools. Um, can I also ask more about being able to communicate with developers whilst doing SEO? Because one thing I've learned about SEO since like one of the first things I learned is that it's a multidisciplinary sorry, multidisciplinary skill, meaning that like when you do SEO, you're going to be in communication with the developers, the UX team, the design team, yeah. and lots of different people. So it's like you're like the center of like a spider that's like just connected to lots of different legs, you could say. I know that analogy is perfect, but you know, it's, it's good enough. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of want to know more about what it's like when you're communicating with other team members within a company and how to actually properly communicate data and the importance of making certain decisions. And then after that, we can talk about more about yeah. building internal tools and using that to gain more organic traffic. Yeah, speed. usually with IT relationships are better if you know this stuff because okay, you are not a developer, but still you talk the you speak their language. Yep. 100%. So the only reasonable requests usually come from the higher ups. Usually when you talk to developers, if you know to code, the relationships are always perfect. Absolutely. Because you know how they think. You know that they are lazy on some topics because you are too. Yeah. You know that sometimes there is no reason to automate something. Mm -hmm. So the relationships skyrocket. Yep. With other teams, I would say that I also do content. So it's always good. I have I've never had problems in general with other teams. The only, uh, the only thing is that, okay, when you talk about data and this stuff, and if you talk to a non-technical person, it's hard because in SEO, we have another a big problem that Google created metrics that are impossible to explain to a non-technical person. For instance, if you explain the difference between clicks, sessions, page views, they're going to ask you rightfully, okay, and what's the difference? They all sound the same to me. I have to explain it. But also, what's an impression? How you measure an impression? Why it's so high? All of this stuff, it's a friction point. It's where you have to practice a little bit because Google can't make good metrics. They can't explain them. So it's hard also for us. 
but usually you have better relationships with the all the other teams yeah yeah absolutely that was amazing and so when you're actually in communication with those other team members is there any sort of things that you have to keep in mind aside from knowing the lingo having good understanding of you know what is they do and whatnot is there any sort of other differences you've noticed with like let's say for example ux because i have people in my family and like relatives who are in like the design yeah. ux space so i'm kind of more curious about because like if you look at user experience like that plays a big big part of seo particularly technical seo i'd argue that like when you actually have a solid technical foundation from an yeah. SEO perspective and your website's f loading fast and it works well, that automatically improves user experience. So could you give maybe some anecdote stories from your experience of working with UX teams? You know, like <laughs> I could imagine, like, let's say you do all the technical SEO stuff and the UX team. No, strangely, strangely, since I don't really do tech SEO at all, I only do content and data. Oh, I see. Yeah. Just I never, of... yeah, I've never worked with UX teams. Yeah. But sometimes they've told me, Yes, but the UX, and they usually answer yes, but to do your rank, yeah, and you see how, <laughs> you see how they react. <laughs> yeah, that's because, hilarious. I mean, you care about UX once you get traffic, even if if it's not organic, you yes, must get traffic definitely. first. Definitely. But in general, I would say if you are good at SEO, most criteria you automatically you know satisfy. Yeah. So you don't have to worry that much. Yeah, definitely. If it is B two B, I would care more about UX. Absolutely. But if you have a, a website where you just monetize with display ads, you can improve UX, okay? Absolutely. But there is a limit if you have your ads running. It's not like you can go broke because <laughs> of UX. So yeah, you have to find the balance. Yeah, definitely. Fully agree with that. Fully agree with that. And uh, yeah, thank you for correcting me because like from the time that we've known each other and like reading your threads, it, it gave yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. It gives off more of a vibe that you're more specialized with technical and like data and stuff. Um, obviously you do specialize with data, but I assume that included like the technical SEO. So my mistake, apologies for that. Um, and going off of that, I kind of want to know more about like your SOPs and your actual processes when doing like client fulfillment in different areas. If you want, we can start with technical audits because that's the first thing I was learning to do when I started SEO. If you scroll back to the bottom of my YouTube channel, it actually shows the two uh seo audio reports one i did for mercedes and one i did for tesla not in a sense of like i work at a company obviously yeah, but yeah, yeah. obviously like training and stuff. that's how yeah yeah so i can't learn more about your so processes with doing technical I only do, and yeah i only do content audits yeah so specific on not technical content audits 100%. and in, in short you have to define assess the current situation find what to improve and what they can do to prevent damage so you define the goals like First, you understand what they want because sometimes it's not often it's not clear what they expect. Then you run through Search Console API analytics, whatever they have, content plans. If they have them, it's good. Uh, lead that all the data they have, the more the better. Even financial data, if you're allowed or if they have. Once you do that, once you do that, I have a process where I just measure which pages are getting the most clicks. Uh, I split pages by organic performance. Like if a page is getting more than 10 clicks and these impressions, put it into this group. And for every group, I assign an action, okay? So if a page is under this group, you have to optimize it or whatever. Yep. And the rest is mainly finding new opportunities by looking at uh, zero keyword uh, queries with zero clicks and all this stuff. If the website is big, you have to focus on a subset because it would be too too much. If the website is small, you can even do some stuff manually. So yeah. this is my process. And I try to keep it actionable because in the past, I've made the mistake of you know making it a little bit unclear. But now, I mean now, usually I make it more actionable. So I try to think and say, if I don't know anything about SEO, if I am like, I don't even care, what would be the best output to, to do it, to apply what this guy said? And I try to reverse engineer it and to say, OK, the action should be that. So I have some content briefs or some stuff in Google Docs, which is very basic, where I tell you, you should optimize this, you should do this. Because people, I told you, want simplified stuff. You start from the complex, yep. from the noise, and you should give them signals, something very easy yep. to use. Yep. I know that something sometimes people consider, normal people consider it offending, yeah. because they can say, ah, I paid the X for a PowerPoint or for this. Yes, of course, but you should consider the output or the impact, not the deliverable. Because in many cases, especially in bigger companies, you are going to use PowerPoint. There is nothing to do. 
You yeah. can do all the cool stuff you want. They will also, they will always ask you, can you give me Excel? Can you do a PowerPoint? And you can do anything about it. So that's mostly it. You just assess the current situation, see which pages are getting the most clicks, which pages are bad, should be updated, which shall be deleted and why. Get as much data you can, backlinks, search console, analytics. Uh, if they have content plans where they cluster articles, even better. Uh, or you do it by yourself. And then if they have sales, conversion, whatever data, it's also bad. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, that was that was amazing. I'm, I'm just taking all of that in. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we spoke about the content audits just then. And you did mention about um, outputs and the outputs of the deliverable that you're providing to the client. Could you talk more about communicating that type of mindset to your clients and to the companies that you work with? Because I think that's something that's really important to go over because yeah. obviously, you know, so yeah so this is actually a great question because that's what a lot of people get wrong and they also got it wrong because no one teaches you it's something you have to learn yeah by doing so in general always 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 ask questions because your idea is totally different from their idea like ask what type of deliverable you would like to see like what do you want because do you want a loom do you want a file what what what's your expectations let's align on that I usually ask them, you know, what would you like to see? What would you like to receive to test their expectations? If they are impossible, you have to downsize them and explain them why, like why this is not possible or why there is a better alternative. But in reality, if you do analysis, but also if you do SEO, it's dealing with unrealistic expectations. People that want to rent tomorrow, people that want, I don't know, an ROI of 5,000 times, and That's impossible crazy. stuff. Yeah. So you have to master the art of asking the right questions and filtering leads or ask, you know, finding if the if it's going to work. And especially if they have the date. Yeah. And don't trust, don't trust what they say because a lot of people, a lot of companies, and this is also a meme in oh. general. You you see some of these memes when company says, Yeah, we have a lot of data, but it's all stored in Excel files. Yeah. Oh, it's not it, you know, they don't, they don't really have a lot of data, actually, or it's very, very messy. So in these cases, I already know, but a lot of people just starting out don't know. So you have to be careful with asking questions and setting the correct expectations. That makes a lot of sense. That was amazing. Um, I think I kind of want to extend that more, um, particularly towards common objections no i don't want this to turn into like an objection yeah, yeah. sales type of video but like common things that you know as clients are asking in relation to seo um in terms of doubts that they may have in terms of its effectiveness and then if you could talk about common like ways that you handle those objections and just reply to yeah yeah now this is actually a very interesting topic because Thank it's you. also something you have to practice and um, in general much like seo in general the, the thing is that a lot of people don't contact you because they want this is strange. Yeah, it's weird. A lot of people it's weird, man. It's like it's like it's like people. Yeah, a lot of people don't contact you because they want to prevent damage, or they want. It's like insurance. They don't want insurance. A lot of people contact you either to grow, or to recover traffic. Yeah. And there is there is nothing wrong with that. There is nothing wrong. The thing is that I have never heard someone telling me I want to improve my processes or the stuff, or I want to prevent damage. <laughs> Because it's a, a bias of our brain. We don't think yeah. about the damage until it happens, right? Absolutely. And then you say, ah, if I had done that, yeah, but you didn't. So that's how it works. In general, the, the most common objections are about, do we get results? But this is in SEO. Do we get results? How long? Or even something like, OK, then, how much writers or resources we need? Yeah. And in all honesty, I'm going to tell you, uh, being a full, I mean, doing full-time consultancy is not something I want to do right now. Also, because it's extremely, extremely, extremely stressing in general. Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, Twitter, Twitter gurus tell you that it's the best life. I agree, consultancy is better than other stuff. I agree, but it's not. All it's stacked up to be. Yeah, yeah, it's not what, what we think, yeah. what yeah. many think. And in general, it's unreliable because you can have months where it's good, months where it's the Sahara Desert. So it's very, 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 you know, risky. 
and in consultancy. But I told you, in any job, you can say something and people will never do it. Even though you do the best course of action, you are perfect. You convince them. Absolutely. So this is something to take into account. And usually how I handle objections depends on who I'm facing, of course. 100%. If they ask me something like, I don't know, about the time, how much it does a CEO take, it's the wrong lead. It means it's the wrong lead because it's not qualified. It means they are still learning or it's a small website. If you have a, a big website, you don't ask this question. Yeah. If you make, I don't know, 2 million per year, you are not a new website. You shouldn't ask this stuff like, how much does this take for SEO? If, it's strange. So it's also good to filter out leads. Yeah. If they ask me, for instance, about the resources they need, I am honest because if you need to produce more content and the competition is strong, you know, I can tell you, you can do it. Yeah, of course, if you don't sleep, if you write it yourself, you can do it. Yeah. But sometimes if you if you tell them, look, you have to spend like 50K to compete, mm. there is no alternative. What should I tell them? Should I lie? No, I tell them, look, this is how it works based on the analysis on the competition. This is a rate of niche. This is an estimate of how much you need to spend in writers to achieve that or what you can potentially achieve. And this is the main issue, especially in the US market. You need budget to compete. Finding a blue ocean is possible, but it's not so easy. And I'm telling you, usually you don't deal with blue oceans. Yep. You deal with saturated niches. Red, really red oceans, yeah. where it's like yeah. just <laughs> especially, sophistication of the Especially hydro. B2B SAS yeah. is the most crowded niche I've ever seen in, in my entire life. <laughs> Everything is crowded. Yeah. Um, if you look for a random article, even though Shopify is maybe unrelated, you still see Shopify or Capterra ranking for yes. everything. And HubSpot uh, and some HubSpot, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's in these cases, I mean, you need money and the thing that agency have the upper hand. Yeah. Because they have more resources, they have more contractual power. So if some of these clients have these objections, they are not the right clients for you. Other times they are, but they have. You know, they don't know the data stuff because they agree. Uh, this is normal. And in those cases, you have to show them some examples or case studies or what you can achieve with what they currently have. Because if you are a, a website just starting, I will never recommend you to pay for an infrastructure and something complex. You start with something simple to get value and then you scale it up. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that was amazing. It's like after every like answer you give, there's like a pause where my brain is just processing. Yeah. <laughs> Your answers are really, really good. Um, a lot better than like what I see in like other SEO podcasts and stuff. Um, subscribe if you're watching this. <laughs> um, yeah. So going off of that, I think now we can talk about building tools and using those to scale SEO. I'm not sure if you or we just spoke about that, but because like yeah. I ask questions and then my brain is muddled because I'm thinking about what your answers. Um, but yeah, so could you talk more about, um, you know, as we mentioned, actually communicating with developers, building tools to scale SEO. For example, like um, if you look at a lot of these like different templates and stuff that people build. So I spoke about Hyperform in one of my videos and how they scale to $3 million uh, how they built, uh, how they scale to eight figures, but their SEO channel brings them around three million dollars in organic revenue per year. And in that video, I spoke about how they use like a template library and they have lots of templates. Then there's other companies who build like tools within their software. So like HubSpot yeah. has like a library of different tools you can use and softwares. And I kind of want to know more about if you have experience around that and how to actually use that scale. Yeah. Okay, that one you're talking about is more about programmatic SEO. Yeah, which I actually never did because oh, I'm yeah. talking about uh, creating internal tools is different. I see. So, for instance, if you need to do something on scale, like scrapping competitors, you can automate it. This is what I mean. Because let's be honest, in practice, you can't pay every subscription in the world. Sometimes you can automate it, and good examples are given by Wise. You know, Wise the money company. Yeah, yeah, money company. Yeah. Uh, Facile dot it, which is an Italian company. Uh, because I know the head of SEO working there. And they posted some examples how they use, you know, this stuff to automate some processes or to extract entities from text, you know, competitor analysis or to evaluate your own content. Because once you have enterprise resources, you can do some crazy tricks. But even for small websites, you can create tools or even develop something in PHP for WordPress. 
you have a lot of options. Like if you want to work on an internal link optimizer, if you want to work on your personal search console dashboard or a script that gives you warnings if something happens. So you have many options. <laughs> the yeah. only the only thing you have to do is to measure how much time you are saving and the costs you are saving. As usual, ROI estimation and this stuff, it doesn't have to be complex. It can be simple and that's it. If you are in a bigger organization, you have more power, you have more convenience to do it yeah. because uh, subscriptions get super expensive and many tools are limited because, you know, enterprise tools are glorified UIs. Yeah. You're paying for bullshit, let's be honest. You're just paying for the same tool that everyone pays, but you have the label enterprise. And this is not convenient for companies because sometimes with even one developer, you can replicate a lot of features and you don't need to scale it much. I'll give you an example. If you have something like, I don't, okay, te technical audits. Screaming Frog in most cases is fine. Eh? Yeah. Unless you have a super big website, okay? But even so, you can create a script. You can do your own crawler with your own stuff that is even faster than those you pay and cheaper. So you have options like this. Instead of paying for a tool, you can create your own search console analyzer. You can have your own dashboards. You have a lot of options available. And what I recommend is not falling for the tools just because they save me time because some of them save you time I agree some of them save you time and it would be stupid to replicate them or impossible but in other cases it's usually convenient to replicate them especially if you want to reduce overhead costs because it would be a pity to pay a lot of money when you can save them and have more features yeah. because you do the features yeah absolutely and I agree with that because um as you mentioned like with having these tools and then actually trying to create them yourself, you do save a lot of time. So for example, like you mentioned, um, you look at, you know, how much time you might save more time, but you have to also look at, and I would add that you have to look at actually, yeah, you might save time, but what type of headaches are you taking on? Right? So for example, yeah. if you're actually like using one of these tools and maybe send bugs with it, or like with majority of payment processes, for example, right? Like, you, you know, you'll use it, but then they'll just like take your money. Um, we all know yeah. some companies that do that. Oh, strike uh and so and like paypal and with these other companies right yeah so yeah they, they're, they're very known for that obviously you wouldn't actually go and create your own uh pay, problem payment process but that's an example of like you know relying on tools heavily and then you know not creating your intern own internal ones and i'm sure there's lots of other examples within like the marketing space sales um design and yeah, things yeah like that. yeah yeah absolutely, absolutely. The, the thing is that we're not automation engineers so it's always in our limits in the limits of even yeah. personal productivity, uh, there is nothing wrong with it because a lot of people think you have to make comp software for, I don't know, Fortune 500, but you, we're not engineers. Yeah. Personal productivity is completely perfect. That's one of the advantages of SEO. You can do whatever you want. Yeah. And boosting your personal productivity is one of those things because, you know, you want to save time or to avoid headache headaches. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that, this, this has been amazing. So... Going off of that, now I think we can dive more and pivot into AI and SEO. I think that's like the big topic that a lot of people want to know about. And, you know, I've seen you speak about this on the timeline on Twitter quite a bit in the past. So I kind of want to know more about how you've been. In so, so one, your thoughts on the implications of ChatGPT and AI on SEO. Two, I also want to know more about like how you're actually using ChatGPT and other AI tools for SEO and also are there any other SEO AI related tools that you think aren't that known. For example, with myself, I've seen tools like AliAI.com, which mm. are like, it's like a technical SEO AI tool. And like, there's lots of tools around that, which are like not that known. However, I've noticed like in the SEO space, one thing that's kind of annoying is that everyone, every SEO guru comes out with like a new SEO tool. Yeah. They're all content writers. They're all content writers. Like very few of them are doing something else in the SEO space or automating other areas in the SEO space. Um, obviously, I know automation isn't the best word to use, but you get where I'm, where I'm coming from. So yeah, I think starting off, we could just go into like your views on the implications of AI on SEO, then talk about uh, yeah. you're using SEO and then furthermore, like the future and like other areas. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, ChatGPT is only an interface for something that already exists before and was abused before. Eh? Yep. Now it's accessible to more people and they like it because it's free so i can use i use it for coding because it's better yeah. i also use it for proofreading my english since i'm not a native sometimes 
there are these phrasal verbs or these English grammar madness yeah. that you get wrong. Can I ask as well? Um, like obviously, yeah, there's the accent and whatnot, but something I've always been curious. I think I asked it in your first Twitter space, but I forgot. Could you share where you're like originally from? Because your accent's really cool. Like you sound like uh, Sicily, Italy, Italy, South Italy. Oh, oh, I see. Okay, that's awesome. the island above North Africa. The yeah, place. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I didn't do geography in like the <laughs> earlier one, so yeah, I, I know where it is. But that's really cool. Um, and also like one thing I, I kind of find cool about you is the accent as well. So like when you're talking about SEO data AI plus the accent, it makes you sound like you know like a scientist, you know. So it's ah, really cool. okay. yeah. no, usually I try to emulate if I have to pick one, the American one. Yeah, it's the cadence should be similar. Yeah, okay, I do my I do my best as I can. Yeah, so, it, it's it's a compliment by the way. I don't mean. Ah, that. thank you. <laughs> yeah. No, so, uh, with ChatGPT, the the thing is that for coding is perfect, fixing English or languages is perfect. Also, I have a prompt. I'm, I'm refining it to rewrite text, the text I, I, I've written before, human text, rewrite it, improve the tone of voice, or use the tone of voice I, I tell them, use active forms, fix the English to be compliant with American English or you know some specific, I don't know, slang, whatever. And then the, the other stuff I usually, I usually ask is let, let me think because I did it today. Yeah, no worries, take a second. Ask, ask, um, the subjects. Yeah. I tell them use the main entity keyword, whatever, as the main subject 60% of the time, something like that. Uh, be careful not to repeat it too much. Use pronouns, otherwise, it's like that. Use yep. uncommon words that a machine wouldn't use. And this actually works. This actually works. Not always, not always, but it's a good beginning. Yep. Avoid using, uh, I, I don't recall how is it called, like the hyphen instead of the comma. I hate oh, it. Yeah. I tell yeah. them just use the comma, don't use the stuff. Yeah. Uh, you give specific instructions, like don't use the semicolon, don't use this. And it works great to rewrite text and stuff. Use maximum this number of words. And this is my main use of chat GPT. So it's mostly productivity, editing, and fixing this stuff. Or I found a use which is actually quite cool. I read it yesterday in a newsletter, and it's, it's quite cool. Oh, those AI newsletters, like, oh, best yeah, yeah. GPT prompts. Yeah. Usually, usually it's random stuff, but this yeah. time it was very good. Oh, I so see. they they took, uh, there, there is this concept called the content matrix by Justin Welsh. You should know. Oh, yeah, Justin right? Welsh, yeah, yeah. And they did a prompt, which was very good, where you just do this matrix with ChatGPT, and I'm currently posting threads on Twitter from yesterday. With, with this idea, and the, the, the output is very good. I put it into Notion. Yep. The output wasn't really perfect yep. because uh, for some reason it inverted two columns. So I just tell them, do a pivot table with how I want it in Notion AI because I, Notion has the AI, even if you have the free version. Yep. Yeah, definitely. So I think I, should talk about yeah, more. Yeah, yeah. And it was quite good. So for personal productivity, it's perfect. If you want to structure stuff, want to do lazy, Lazy stuff like I have this stuff. Build me a list. Give me a bullet list. It's perfect. Uh, a lot of people don't really like it because they think, eh, but it's inaccurate. Yeah, okay. Also, humans are inaccurate. You should know how to use it, how to do good prompts because a lot of people write half a line of prompts and it's like, of course, it's bad. You should be very specific unless you're improving the prompt. If it is your second round, you can all you can also drop a one liner like continue improve it, but if it is your first prompt, you have to be very specific, very detailed, and give when you prompt always give examples, example of input, example of output, yep. of example of throughput, whatever you want, and it works like a charm. For instance, uh, if you have uh, a list of items, uh, build me a table with this stuff, okay. Put them into a columnar format. Yep. You have to tell you have to tell ChatGPT the input would be a list like this one. The output, and you give a sample like you write one word, a new line, another word, etc. To you know to let the machine understand how you want it. So that's how you use it: personal productivity, uh, making order out of unstructured data, and coding English and so on. Amazing. I, I prefer to mute myself when the other person's talking just to, <laughs> it's, because uh, there's also background noise here. Uh, East London's quite loud. Um, so 
Yeah, that's amazing. And so can we talk more about Notion AI and how you sort of use that? And then we can also talk about like other AI tools that you're using as well, um, because that's something I, I kind of want to learn more about as well. OK, Notion AI, I admit that I don't use Notion that much. But since when they introduce AI, it's much, much better, because in practice, some stuff is manual and boring. As you ask the AI, and they do it for you. And Notion has a great integration. So Notion, I use it as my second brain. I should use it more, actually. I agree with productivity gurus. It's a good tool. This it's a good tool, um, I, especially for the AI when you have to build tables, where you have to track something. It's a very reliable tool. Uh, you can also access via Apple ID, so extra points. And the other, I mean, Notion is only for storing data, brainstorming, Notion AI. So very very simple use cases. For all the rest. For having a database or to do contemplates, the best tool on the market, and I am 100% sure, is Airtable. Like, I don't even have a doubt about Airtable. Like, uh, Amazing. Amazing. sure. Yep. Uh, I don't know if they have AI options. I think they do, but yeah. they've never used them because it's already a great tool. Yeah, so, I've, yeah, I've recently started using Airtable, so like I'm a newbie with it. So it's it's, it's gonna take a minute for me to like learn it. So I'm definitely not, like. Yeah, in right. general, it's it's quite good. You can yeah. also integrate with Zapier or the competitor, ClickUp. No, I think I, I think um, Zapier probably probably. I'm not 100 percent sure. Yeah, no, no, it's Zapier it. for sure. But there is a competitor, the cheaper oh, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't recall the name because yeah. it's a lot of competitors to yeah. Zapier. And there's all the same like logos just popping up. And yes, <laughs> yes. It, it gets muddled up quite a lot, especially yes. in that space. Like it's all just the same companies doing the same stuff. All have very yeah, yeah. logos and like it's usually like a symbol and then it's like a letter and then, yeah, <laughs> yes. So yeah. It does get repetitive. And since I do SaaS SEO, so I work with SaaS companies, B2B SaaS companies, it's extremely like crowded. As you mentioned, it's extremely like loud and it's extremely just not extremely, but it's quite mundane because you see this yeah. lot of the same consistencies across. Um, and I'd argue it's quite the same in a lot of other industries in the SEO space, like e com and like local IT. Yeah. So, yeah. But e commerce, I would say, in my opinion, there are more opportunities in e commerce because, stupid example. Yeah. Fidget spinners when they were popular. <laughs> yeah. It was a new niche. I, I wouldn't believe anyone telling me, yeah, I always sold them. It's impossible. Yeah. Because no one cared. No, I didn't even know they were a thing, maybe. So that's an example. So I think e commerce is the best in terms of opportunities. In terms of money, I would say I don't even have a doubt B2B SAS. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, uh, I'll be 100% honest, like, the two reasons I went into B2B SaaS SEO, so the first one being that I do plan on starting my own, like, SaaS company later down the line, um, and I would like to learn, while well, I am learning SEO and how to do, apply it to SaaS companies so I can become a CMO, or, like, chief marketing, like, officer yeah. for my own SaaS company later down the line, because I don't like the idea of, oh, I came up with the idea, so I have to be CEO, I'd rather just play to my strengths of just being yeah. good at this marketing and then just play to that and then just scale the SaaS to, like, eight, nine figures a year and then sell to crazy uh, exit multiples because the exit multiples in SaaS are nice. I think that's one of the main reasons why it's so crowded is because yeah. the is high. Um, but the barrier, up to, up, the barrier to entry is like at a fairly like high level, fairly. Um, and then the second, obviously, is just the revenue potential. Obviously, with you when you look at these SaaS companies, their budget usually for content marketing and SEO is quite solid. So uh, yeah, you know, it depends obviously on the company, but um, it's quite interesting. So. The, but the primary, like 95% of the reason I went in was because I viewed it as a stepping stone to what I want to achieve later. So if my clients are listening, it's not just about the money. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, it, it's mainly just because I want to gain the experience and learn how to apply to SaaS company so I can start my own. Later down the line with some uh, other people I know who are quite competent in like development and management and operations. Yeah. And things like that. So yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of me. If there's any uh, anything else you want to comment on that, or maybe you want to talk more about... Um, Anything we've just spoken yes, about? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Well, one thing in particular that I think is important is about the division of labor, like you just mentioned. Absolutely. So a lot of people, and this is the old mindset, yep. the mindset of many senior SEOs. They usually think that doing it all is better. But honestly, in advanced countries, in advanced economies like US, all these countries, you don't want, in my opinion, especially if you're young like us. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want you don't want to be a, a generalist first because no one will believe you. First of all, absolutely. And second because a lot of veterans have no clue about the stuff we are talking about. 
So it's a great chance to diversify and to be essential because at the end of the day, it's all about strategy, right? It's all about politics. So if you are specialized, if you do something specific, you became, you become, you know, reliable, you become a, an essential piece of the chessboard. But if you do something generic, you are easy to be replaced. So my advice and something I work, my, you know, my belief is that one should start to focus on something and master it. Like Absolutely. a samurai and this sword, we can say, you should master something very specific, dig deeper. Then of course you pick up other skills, there is nothing wrong, but I agree with the T-shaped idea. I strongly with, with that, yeah. I think it's yeah. true. Uh, it's one of the few American concepts, buzzwords that I agree with because it makes <laughs> sense. Yeah. I think it's great because in practice, you want to master something and not be a jack of all trades because otherwise you have no distinctive pictures. And you know, when you talk about someone, something, everything in your life, you tend to recall unique stuff for if something strange or unusual happened. So if you're like other people or you don't diversify, it's worse. And it's also good for the community, for the industry, because if everyone is diversified, if everyone is more special, I think there is more room to everyone. Of course, you still need generalist people because you need someone to piece everything together. Of course, it's not like you don't need them. You still need them. But especially if you're young, you know, we can't afford to be generalist or it's not convenient. So it's better to have a perk, something unique that the others can't replicate easily. I mean, you will always have some competition, someone trying to emulate you or you are emulating someone. But even so, you should always aim to have that some distinctive features. I told you, uh, like you do B2B SAS, that's already one. But again, maybe later you want to diversify and, and say, I don't want to do B2B SAS as a whole. I want to do B2B SAS for, I don't know, for food software yeah. in this country, for this CMS, whatever. Yeah. Something more specific. I personally like really enjoy working with like, companies that are the, the main like industry so the current client i'm working with they're in the digital adoption SaaS space and i really enjoy working with them they're my only client at the moment um but when i look at like other industries i also want to specialize in it's mainly just like you know the crm SaaS space and the marketing automation SaaS space and like the types of companies where they sell a software where i can actually understand what they're doing yeah because right? like in the b2b SaaS space there's a lot of companies where yeah like, yeah they, they they're making like nine figures a year something crazy and then you ask okay what does your software actually do and it's always like, oh, yes, yeah, supply chain management automation. Yeah. They just throw all these buzzwords out. Yeah. And, and, like, they still can't explain it simply. And I'm just there scratching my head thinking, like, how did I yeah, yeah, yeah. this money? You know? uh, I completely agree. One of the things we have to mention is domain knowledge. Yeah, so absolutely. like in, the, in, the, in analytics, it's the same. If you work in business and you analyze business data, you must know business. I don't care if they tell you, no, it's not. No, no, no. You must know business. And the same is in SEO. That's why I prefer to work with content websites or publishers, because at least I know the website model, maybe not the topic, but the model is the same. The metrics yep. are the same. But yep. in general, what you said is, I mean, it's very smart because you have to focus on what you can understand. Otherwise, you won't be able to help them or you won't be diversified enough. So if you pick an industry and study it, you're more likely to make money compared to being a generalist and saying, I accept everyone or I accept every B2B SAS. Because in the long run, you will see that there are a lot of people that a lot of potential clients that have no one because a lot of people chase the, you know, chase the ad, but don't go for the long term. Absolutely. Absolutely. That was amazing. Thank you for the kind words. So I appreciate that. Um, yeah. I mean, we, how we can go for like another maybe five ten more minutes yeah sure any sure, other sure ideas anything you want to just share anything you want to sure. talk about uh, is there anything in particular that you want to share to the audience or maybe advice for people starting out things like that sure okay so in general uh, i know it's obvious but for some people it's controversial but yeah. i don't care and they will say it anyway yeah i think that you should start with your websites okay if it's b2b you can't if you're a normal person you can you can't really start with a b2b website I mean, if it's B2C, it's easier. Start a blog, find your niche, formulate a strategy. It will fail. You don't care. It's better than a degree. Start, learn something, 
understand how it works, okay, and start putting some hours so we'll have some portfolio or stuff to show. Uh, when I went to college, a mistake a lot of, 99% of the people did, not a lot, everyone did, is that they were kind of convinced that they were superior. Yep. Because, ah, I have a degree, then they have to arm me. It doesn't work like that, unfortunately. So Absolutely. in the meanwhile, I was working on side projects, a lot of them, uh, um, a lot of them. And I had the edge because then it stacks over time, it compounds. And so my recommendation is use social media, link it in Twitter. Twitter, if it will last, I hope so. Uh, use social media, have your own newsletter. Your, your, your camera zoomed in for some reason. Um, uh, I don't know, but it's fine. Eh? It's, it's still fine. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah, I was saying, um, build your stuff, test on your stuff so you feel the risk. Because it's easy to work on other people, but work on your stuff. Absolutely. Try to figure out how some things work in practice. So you will build authentic experiences. And a lot of people will tell you, yeah, OK, but if you work for an agency, OK, but you still need to have your own website. Because I know a lot of people, even not in SEO, in other industries, that ask you, OK, but how did you start? How can I start? Because if you start later, it's always harder. So I recommend start early. Yep. Even if it's unsuccessful, give it a try. Build your own website, test, write, you know, double with it a little bit. And the same goes for <laughs> your expertise. Document it, build some projects, have a portfolio, because this will be appreciated. Of course, I'm telling you, I think university degrees are important for social standing and social standing is extremely important in life in general. The idea of social standing, of the having a social circle is important. I'm not saying it's mandatory, of course not, but I would It has its benefits. Yeah, it has its own benefits, unfortunately. And the same is true for MBAs. Yep. They teach you nothing. It's only for the network. Yeah. Uh, you pay for the network. It's the same concept. Um, so I would recommend stacking as much as you can, yep. but always be practical, have projects, show that you did, did something else, because I can tell you that the other people in general won't do it. Yep. They, will consume, they will consume, but never produce. Yep. So if you already produce something, you have an edge over other people, which is not indifferent. And a, a lot of stuff, in my opinion, you have to unlearn. Yep. Especially if you come from non-English countries like me, because, okay, in cities like London or in the US or UK in general, there is a different mindset that is more business friendly, it's more risk propense. Yeah. In other absolutely. places, it's risk averse. Risk averse, yeah, absolutely. So you want to unlearn it. I'm not saying you should waste money, no, but you should risk a little bit more, waste a little bit more time, you know, on some stuff because it will pay off in the long run and the benefits are real. Yep. And compared to other career paths, the advantage of SEO, but every stuff related to technology or digital is that you have so many options. There are so many sub niches that there will never be full saturation, I think. Mm. So it's very better to start now, figure out what you like and double down on it, which is something they don't teach you in university and they don't teach you anywhere else, not even your parents. It's something you have to learn the hard way. So by attending the online communities and social media, because honestly, 90% of what I know comes from LinkedIn and Twitter. Yeah. Right? Reading people, bookmarking, going back, reading for years, mm -hmm. applying, saying this makes sense, this doesn't make sense and continuing it's i know it sounds strange because people will tell me yeah but it's is it that easy yes it's that easy because a lot of knowledge is not gated as we think and a lot of stuff especially if you come from certain countries is quite easy so yeah social media is a great advice yeah absolutely awesome awesome um yeah well marco that was amazing really appreciate you taking the time uh, I think we'll wrap it up from there. But for those of the people who are watching you and they want to get more content from you and more uh, inspo and knowledge, where would you say is the best place for them to connect with you? Ooh, okay. So Twitter, 
yep. where you can Google my um, search for my name, yep. LinkedIn as well. But yep. I recommend my newsletter and personal website because yep. it's all together, which is called seotistics.com, which is SEO plus statistics combined. Yep. Absolutely. So it's seotistics.com where you can also find my you can also sub subscribe to my newsletter where i send weekly tips every monday so tomorrow Amazing. or when it will be record maybe. yeah this okay, is whatever. Awesome, like, right now as soon as it's done i'm posting it just to clarify uh, okay okay even but, better yeah i don't i don't like the idea of like oh you record it and you post it like a week later or yeah something. that's crazy like just po post it now <laughs> okay <laughs> but yeah so um, I'll be linking all of that in the description. That's why I also just say it out loud so I know, it, so I can note down in my brain what to, you know, uh, note down and uh, put in the description. But yeah, Marco, that was absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, chat to you soon. And yeah, thank you for coming back. It means a lot. Likewise, Sam. It was a pleasure. Absolutely. Bye, man. Take care, my brother. Bye. Bye. -bye.